And I was struck with how little really is in our control anyway. And we take a little bit of control here and a little bit of control there, and it gives us the illusion that we're actually in control of something. And she's not really in control of anything. And one of the passages of Scripture that came to mind the other day was God knows the number of hairs on your head, which means he knows how many you've lost. And you guys wash your hair, you look down in the drain, you see that clump of hair. He knows how many there are, right? And he knows how many are left. And for some of you, that's no big feat that he knows how many hairs you have on your head. But for others of you, that is a huge thing for God to know how many hairs are in your head. And, but it's out of our control. Everything is really out of our control, and we need to recognize that, the sovereignty of God. He is still in control, and we are not, even though we take a bit of control and try to adapt. Still, there's so little that we have in our control. So what does it do? What well, brings us to two things. Either we, we stress out because things are out of our control and we can't predict what's going to happen, or we're driven to our knees. The Apostle Paul chose the knee route. And Ephesians chapter 3 begins with those very words, this, at least this section of chapter 3 in verse 14. This portion of the letter is one of Paul's powerful prayers. And I love it that he took some time to write out what it was that he was praying for people because it informs me how to pray for others. And I think it may help you as well as we look at the various things that Paul said to pray for and then apply that to where we are in our lives individually. I'm going to give you a few that I've seen recently and then I hope that you'll gain some insights and benefits from that as well. So would you open your Bibles? Do you have your Bible with you this morning? Who has your Bible? Let me see it. Get it up there high. Be proud. If you don't have your Bible, then, you know, repent. Verse 14. For this reason. All right, if it says for this reason, maybe I ought to go back just a little bit before this. Do you think? What is the for this reason? Well, let's go back to at least verse 7. And notice what Paul has been arguing before he gets to this point. Although I think that the for this reason goes back even further than this. Verse 7. Of this gospel, of this good news, I was made a servant, a minister, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints... This grace was given to preach or proclaim to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church, that's us, Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart, over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Pause a moment and hear the gravity of what Paul is saying about what he's been called to do. Though, he says, I am the least of the saints. Why would he say that? Because at one time, he actually killed the saints. He was the one who arrested, threw in the jail, had tortured, and some of them put to death, who We're following Jesus Christ, and now he himself is a follower of Jesus, and he considers himself, due to his history, I'm the least of all the saints. Some of you say, well, Paul's dead, and I've taken his place. He said he was a chief of sinner. He's no longer around. I've taken the place of chief of sinners. No, you haven't, because I have. (laughs) We all feel we have taken Paul's place as the least of sinners or the chief of the least of the saints, the chief of sinners. But here's where he really felt the heaviness 
of the call. I want you to take the mystery and express this to the church and to those who don't know Jesus. The mystery that's been hidden up in God through all of the ages, that through the church he would reveal his manifold wisdom. Now think of the wisdom of God as a curtain that's kind of together and has many, many folds in it. So the manifold wisdom, as you pull back the curtain and stretch it out, you see things perhaps of a pattern that you would never have seen if the folds were still together. So what he's done is through us, pulled us out and said to the world, look at my wisdom world, but not just to the world and not just to the lost. These are the angels who have rebelled as well as the angels who have stayed true to God. These are the spiritual forces of wickedness that are at work in this world who, are, who never saw it coming. They thought they had defeated the Son of God when they killed Him, and God used Jesus, the dead Jesus, buried in the tomb, raised Him from the dead, to defeat the satanic forces. They didn't see it coming. The manifold wisdom of God is revealed, not just in the resurrection of Jesus, but in your resurrection. When you surrender to him and you turned your life over to him and you were buried with him and you were raised together with him, he, he, he took the very thing that they thought they had beat God with and they said, God said, I'm going to show you. And he took the very cross, which they thought was foolish, they took the resurrection, which they now know is powerful, and God applied it to each of us. And God said, I will show my wisdom. And this is to the angels who stand back with their jaw dropped and said, oh, wow. And they, they're amazed at what God has done, not just of his power. They knew his power. They couldn't figure out the direction he was headed. There's an interesting passage in Scripture that says, angels longed to look into these things. And so God showed, has been showing for 2,000 years now, He has been showing His wisdom through the church. Well, I'm looking at you guys and I'm thinking, what is the wisdom of God and how is it being shown through us? And then it hits me. Weak, fallible, fumbling, stumbling, selfish, in grace, and yet he still, through his love and his mercy and his patience, shows through you a power that the world has never seen, except, and would never see, except for you. You. You are an expression of the wisdom of God to the world and to the angels. And Paul says, I just want you to see what that is, what this mystery is. And the mystery is this. Those of us who are not from the Jewish uh, descent are in Christ. And Christ is in us. That's the mystery according to Colossians 1. Colossians 1 verse 26, that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Okay, so that's being revealed through us, and there's many other things that are being revealed, and let's see what some of them are. Paul says, the weight of this call drives me to my knees because, you see, I can't plan things out so as to maneuver myself in position of people's lives and, and figure out how I can say the right thing at the right time in the right place to the right people so that they're going to hear the gospel in the, in the way that they need to. I'm just not that smart. I'm not that wise. And Paul says, it drives me to my knees because I know of all the people in the world, who am I to express the good news of Jesus to other people? I can't do it, but God can. God will open doors that you never dreamed he would open up for you to be the expression of his wisdom to others. I know that through the radio spots, we're touching people's lives. Some of you have told me, Lynn and Trish are now living with us. My middle girl and her husband, they're both physical therapists. I've mentioned them. They're looking for work now. And so this week they had five interviews. Pretty cool. I'm thinking... 
okay, let's move one of those interviews to work, and that's good. <laughs> but they're, they're, uh, they have some time to be choosy, and they've got the right to do that, and, and I think they're going to have the opportunity to be choosy. So I said all that to say. One guy that was interviewing them out in Caldwell said, I see that uh, by the email of, of your wife that it's a Skidmore. Is she related to a Skidmore in Meridian? And she, he said, yes. And he said, is this the same Kevin Skidmore that's on the radio? And he said, yes. Well, actually, he said, is that that Baptist preacher that's on the radio? <laughs> it's always talking about the cross. <laughs> Well, <laughs> we think we figured out what was going on there because they graduated from Southwest Baptist University in Bolivar, Missouri. And so that's on her resume along with Skidmore. And then she, he's putting this together. Is that that Baptist preacher? I thought it was hilarious. Well, that was interesting. And then somebody else said, you know, how uh, several of you have told me that it's open doors of opportunity for you whenever they hear that you're part of this church family. Oh, are you guys the ones who do that radio spot? And, and it's continuing to open more doors with having people visit and stuff like that. I went to KBOI's business breakfast one, uh, one Tuesday morning. You've heard it advertised perhaps, but they sponsor a breakfast with NNU business department once a month. So I decided to attend. Nate Shellman got up and he introduced uh, the various people who were there. And he said, and Bill Russell and Kevin Skidmore, who are my co-hosts, they sub for me when I'm here. They're both here. Would you please stand? We stood and people applauded. And I uh, said, so, you know, that's pretty cool. And, and then every, a lot of people came up afterwards and shook hands, wanted to get to know, you know, who this guy is, blah, blah, blah. One fellow waited a little bit after everyone was gone. And he came up to me and he said... I need to tell you that I really appreciate what you're doing on the radio. And I said, well, thank you very much. And he said, no, no, I need to tell you how much it means to me. I said, okay, what's going on? And he said, two years ago, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we went through two of the hardest months of our life. Every morning, I got up to go to work, or I went to the gym a little early, but I'd get up and go, and as I, as I got in my car and turned on the ignition, right then or just shortly after that, there was your spot. Upbeat, positive, all about Jesus and the cross and the resurrection, and hope-filled. You helped me go through the hardest time of my life. And I just want to tell you, I really appreciate it. I said, how's your wife doing? He said, we're doing well. Now, I have to tell you, there's been some interesting conversations about the radio spots. That one shook me because I didn't dream of, I'm going to get on the radio. I'm going to do this radio spots, and, and it's going to affect somebody who's going through. Got it? God used us, used that, used us in a way that we would not have planned out. And we couldn't. We can't. So Paul says the manifold wisdom of God is expressed through his church. Now watch verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family, or a better translation might say the whole family. But I think every family might be a good translation because you see the idea of family did originate with God. And he defined the family from the beginning. And it was Adam and Eve and their children that made family. And every family de derives its name from God. God's idea of family, both physical and spiritual, that all came out from God himself. God is the author of family. So I bow my knee before the Father from whom the whole family or every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant to you to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in your inner being. Pause a moment. 
When you pray for me and when you pray for each other and when you pray for your family members, when you pray for your former, former boss who's going through a very rough time, I'm talking now directly, I don't usually do this, but when you're praying for specific people, may I suggest to you that this is one of the things that would be very good for us to pray? Instead of just, Lord, bless him, Lord, keep him safe, Lord, give him courage. How about I pray that you'll be strengthened with power in the inner person through faith in Christ? How about we pray for power to be able to stand up under the pressure, not just to stay, uh, not just to make it through, but to really... There's a difference between surviving and thriving. How about we pray for people through the power of Jesus to really thrive? And that we pray for them to stand firm... My prayer for the persecuted church, the ones who the 220-some, isn't just for their release. I do pray for their release. I pray that, that God will work a miracle. I think it'd be powerful if He did. But what I'm really praying for is that God will strengthen them on the inside to not give in and to not turn their back on Jesus whenever the pressure's on and they're watching the swords come down on the back of the heads of their own family and their own friends, and they know the only reason that they're there is because of their dependence and their love and their trust in Jesus Christ. And they look at them and they look at this and they lay their head down, and I pray God give them strength so that they will not turn their back on Jesus at the toughest time of their life. If they can do that and I can pray for them, do you think I can be by their side? at that point in their lives. Yes, and that's what God's calling us to do, the unpersecuted church, to pray for the persecuted church. And I believe that we can be involved in that. Paul says, I'm praying that you can be strengthened in the inner man through your, through your faith in Jesus, through the Spirit, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That's not a redundancy because Jesus is always dwelling in our hearts, right? Do I have to ask him to do something that he's promised that he already will do? No, it's not the point that I have to. So what's Paul maybe really, I'm suggesting, what is he really praying for here is not that, Jesus, would you stay in their hearts, please? He's already promised that he will. So who needs to be aware of that? Isn't it the person who's going through the tough time? Pray that they'll know that you're there. That they'll be strengthened and that Christ will dwell in your hearts. Well, he's already promised that he's going to. So I think what Paul is praying is help them know and help them remember that you're right there with them. And you're not just beside them, you're inside And by giving power from the inside, they're going to be able to face things on the outside. There's a difference between I'm strengthened by the fact that you're by my side and that you actually come inside and live your power through me. You see the difference? And so when I pray for people, I want to pray, cause things to happen throughout the day to help Nelson realized that you're with him all the time. I pray that you'll help him to have eyes that will see that you're inside him today. Cause something to remind him of that. Why? Well, because I know Nelson's forgetful. And I know he's forgetful because I also know you're also forgetful. And I know you're also forgetful because I know I'm forgetful. And we get caught up in the stress of the moment or the temptation of the moment and we forget who we are. We forget who lives inside us. We forget whose we are. And I want to pray for you and I want you to pray for me that we remember who we are and we remember whose we are and we remember who lives inside us. God, help him remember that you're always there by his side and inside and living your, your good news, living your love through him. Okay, and touching other people. You got that idea, let's move on. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend, to grasp hold of, and understand and be filled with, that's the idea of comprehend, with all the saints, 
what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Four dimensions. Breadth and length and height and depth of his love. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Pause a moment. He's just prayed two things about love. That you grasp it and understand it, comprehend it, and that you would know it. Wait a minute, I thought understand and comprehend would be the same as knowing. No, you would know it in an experiential way. I have found it very easy to talk to other people about the love that God has for them. I need to know God's love for me. And in fact, if I don't really know his love for me, I can't really effectively communicate it to someone else. I need to experience it myself before I can communicate it to others. But let me tell you this. When you do, when you experience the love of God, its height, depth, length, and width, when you know the four-dimensional love of God, and the more you're immersed in His love, and the more you experience His love, you won't keep quiet about it. I cannot tell people what I have not experienced or understand myself. But once I have experienced it and I continue to grow and understand it, I will tell more people about it. So what do we do? Let's focus on that. Let's pray about that for each other. What I'm really praying for is help Mark. Mark. How many more Marks do we have here? Help Mark and Mark and Mark and Mark. Let's all say we're all Marks. I'd be on the mark to say that because we're all the same. I'm going to pray for individuals, so I'm going to call each of you out. I'm going to say, help each of them to grow in their understanding of your love. Help Mark to be so consumed with your love that he, he experiences the love that it beyond, is beyond understanding. And that in doing so, Deborah's going to experience that through him. And in doing that she's going to experience the kind of love that Jesus has for his church, which Paul was calling the husband to give and to place her centerpiece. Got it? That the prayer is, is where it's really at in people's lives. We need to be better lovers. And it goes beyond the looking at each other and giving a hug and saying, I love you. But I think that's a good place to start. We don't hear it enough. We don't say it enough. How about if we were to pray publicly that we would grow in love and that be a centerpiece of every prayer we pray for each other? Is there anyone in this room whose life would go a little better if you loved more? If you grew in love like God, do you think maybe things would... And you'd be able to handle things differently. What do you think? How about if you were loved with the kind of love that God loves us with? Do you think your life would be a little better? Yes. And so, let's pray for each other that we will benefit from God answering the prayers that you guys would grow in love. Then I'll feel it more. And you'll feel it more when I, when I grow in love. Do, do you see where we're headed with this? Because where Paul was headed is probably not where you'd be headed. I don't mean beheaded. But where you would... <laughs> That's a different point. <laughs> Paul's conclusion in this prayer is stated here. Because if God does all that Paul is asking God to do, the purpose is stated in this last part of the sentence. So that. The word is hina, in order that. Or so that. So that what? So that you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. The Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all part of this prayer. 
I bow my knee before the Father, that he fill you in the inner man through his spirit. In your faith in Jesus, you'd be filled with him in your heart. And you'll be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't want to just come in and have a little bit of gas in my tank. I want to fill it up. All right, fill me up with God. You can keep me going. Help me make it through my life. Help me face the struggles that I'm faced with. I've got the fullness of God. And this letter, by the way, is full of fullness passages. I'm focused on this passage because now we're at the climax. Paul runs out of hyperbole. Hyperbole is where you can't say it any bigger or any, any greater than what he has said. And this is the hyperboles of hyperbole in Scripture, is verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. Imagine is one passage. According to the power at work within us. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we're able to ask or imagine. It's another way of translating that. Immeasurably more. I can imagine a lot of things, but my prayers don't indicate that. I don't know about you. I've been kind of challenged by this passage to stop praying little prayers. Well, what would a big prayer look like then? Well, give me an example of a big prayer, Kev. How about a big prayer for healing? How about a big prayer for thousands of people coming to know Jesus? My prayer for years has been, put me in a position where thousands and thousands and thousands of people that I might be useful to reach, thousands of people. I want to pray big. Zig Ziglar said, shoot for the stars. If you miss it, you'll catch the moon on the way back down. I want to shoot for the stars in my dream, in my prayers and in my dreams. I imagine big things of what God's going to do through us. Us, little us, little Boise Church of Christ, to reach an entire valley, to reach an entire state, to reach the entire Northwest, to reach into the world with the good news. And we are involved in doing those things. Can we do it more? Can we do it bigger? Yes, but how? I don't know. But God does. That part's not in my control. I can cut some hair. I can do a little bit. But... What God is able to accomplish is far more than what we could ever dream. And by the way, it's through the power that is at work. Do you see that right at the end of this verse? It is through, according to the power that is at work within us. But what's the final analysis of our life? It's got to be this. It's got to be this. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and ever and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. And when you're out of evers, there's still a thousand more. Ever. Amen. That's a high calling, my friend. For you to do your carpentry, or your nursing, or as a student to study for a test to the glory of God. For you to sit at a meal and interact with your spouse or with your children to the glory of God. For you to drive on the stinking interstate with the back up to the glory of God. For you... To, to be treated like you've been treated at work or, or in this church for that matter. For you to respond in a way that would bring God glory. How about it? Is there a higher calling than that? That means I give up who I am and what I am for His glory. And when I do, I find who I am and what I am. You don't find your life any other way than giving it up for the Lord. 
For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For me to live is Christ means I'm living to his glory, not to mine. I like to be an instrument that if people see anything in me or they hear anything in me, that they see this and then they immediately see the spotlight to who it goes to, and that's Jesus himself. May that be your prayer for others and for yourself. Would you stand with me and let's pray. God, Father, I pray that you would strengthen us with power in the inner man, that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we will know your love, will comprehend together with all the saints all over the world, that we will understand and live out how high, how deep, how long, how wide your love is. And that we'll, we'll know that love so that the love of Jesus which surpasses all understanding so we can be filled up to the, to the full with you. Now, God, to you, you who are able to do far abundantly above, beyond all that we can ask or imagine because of the power that you're unleashing in our lives. To you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus our Lord throughout all generations. Make us your instruments of peace. And to your glory. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. I want to ask you something. Are you living your life to the glory of God? This is time for you to spend just between you and God. Examine your heart. Are you ready to surrender everything today to Jesus? Everything. Put it aside. Would you humbly accept what Jesus said? The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. Will you humbly accept what Peter promised? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll have the Holy Spirit. Will you humbly accept what Ananias told Saul? Why are you waiting? Why? Get up, be baptized. Wash away your sins. Call in on his name. Will you humbly surrender yourself to the Lordship of Jesus today? Because he's calling your name. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. That's a holy dwelling of the presence of God. Let's sing.